Okay, it's 7-12, we're gonna call the meeting to order. Um, we are going to start with the pledge and then I will review the agenda. So if everybody could please stand, the flag is right over here. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag, flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, can we have a roll call, please? Jim Batson. Here. Kara Benjamin. Here. Don Carmichael. Here. Kara Drumkey. Lisa Hessel. Here. Sonal Kulkarni. Here. Casey Rooney. Here. Great. We note that all board members are present. Um, I'm going to review the agenda. We're going to start off with communication, including invitation for public comment. Do we have any email public comment tonight? We do not. Okay. Uh, then we will have the president's report and the superintendent's report. We will go through our consent vote agenda. This means these are things that we discussed in committee. We will not discuss them again before voting on them. Um, Chairperson Batson for the program and personnel committee will take us through uh, several of our board policies for review of first reading. We will vote on two items and then in facilities and finance, we will be voting on a couple of items. Um, <coughs> Carrie, are there any updates for IS? Sorry, Jim, are there any updates for ISB? No, not really. No. Anything for CEDAW? Super brief. Got it. We'll discuss future, future agenda items. And tonight we will retire to executive session for the purpose of discussing the employment of employees, 5 ILCS 120 2C1. Also for collective negotiating matters, 5 ILCS 120 2C2. And finally, the lease of property, 5 ILCS 120 2C5. When that adjourns, we will return to open session for the purpose only of adjourning the board meeting. We will take no further action at that time. So let's get started. We've got a busy night. Um, do we have anybody here who would like to uh, address the board for public comment? Lisa Hessel, president. Any public comment? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll roll right into the president's report. Um, I, we have some student recognition that uh, Dr. G is gonna start with. Thank you very much. Uh, we are excited this evening to introduce Isabella Izzy Ramos, who is a, a swimmer with our girls swim and dive team. Uh, Izzy is a junior uh, and uh, her coach, Coach Block, uh, describes her as one of the hardest working kids on the team, a quiet leader, and one that just plain old gets it done. In uh, the conference this year as a junior, Izzy uh, won the conference in the individual medley, the 200 individually medley, right? Which is swimming all four strokes, right? Conference champion, number one in the conference, then on to sectionals, placed second in sectionals in a very difficult sectional uh, in this area. Uh, and then on to the state meet in which she earned all state honors, finishing 12th in the entire state of Illinois. So let's give it up for Izzy Rebel. Audience clapping, audience clapping. Dad, you can go over there and take a picture. Photographs being taken, photographs being taken. Audience clapping. Audience clapping. While we are very proud of our Vernon Hills uh, swimmers, we also are here tonight to honor some um, of our outstanding Libertyville High School swimmers as well. Uh, I'm going to bring up our varsity girls swim coach and our varsity boys swim coach, uh, Mike Cunningham. Tom Coolant as principal. Tom Coolant as principal. All right. Um... I have with me today uh, two of our two of our honorees. Um, and if they can come on up, and I'll tell you a little bit about them. Uh, we'll go Sophia Tianjalis and Sarah Wu. 
They are two parts of our um, school record setting relays. Um, Sarah swims a butterfly for our medley and Soph swims a backstroke for our medley relay. And then they're both part of the 200 freestyle relay, both which set school records this season um, and multiple times pool records. And then Soph also set a uh, 100 backstroke school record again this year. Um, both ended up with all state um, in the relay, in the 200 freestyle relay, just missing. We ended up 14th in the 200 medley relay. We ended up um, seventh in the 200 freestyle relay. And then 11th. 11th sorry it's been a, it's been a long season 11th in the uh, 100 backstroke so uh amazing powerful women and they did a great job this year audience clapping audience clapping photographs being taken photographs being taken Audience clapping. Audience clapping. Photographs being taken. Photographs being taken. Okay. Now we will turn it over to our student school board representatives for their reports. Student rep. Hi, okay, so Vernon Hills High School is trying out a new way of final exams this year. Our new format has gotten rid of exam week schedule and has replaced it with, the, with three eight period days on the last week of school. The teachers have now had to shorten their tests to either fit within a 45 minute period or to span between multiple days. Only 25% of all courses are giving finals after this change and those classes are mostly in the math and science department. Just over 50% of math classes are giving finals. Additionally, most finals are accounting for 10% of student grades instead of the traditional 20% from years past. Monday and Tuesday of next week are the busiest days for students as both days have a double the number of assessments and projects due. Most, most teachers are keeping Wednesday clear so that students have time to make up work or make use of the extended time accommodations. Compared to other years, students like myself are feeling a major decrease in stress but there is an increase in confusion rising from the differences in exam formats. Certain teachers are choosing to give assessments this week instead of next, while others are using the last week to host up to three day exams. Junior Ariel Schifrin, who takes AP Calculus BC, AP Physics 1 and 2, and AP US History, said that the lack of staggering in these classes is creating very fatiguing schedules for those taking multiple AP courses. He also said that while teachers are making efforts to determine congested days for students, overlap will still occur as tests are stretched. However, it does feel very nice to not have to worry about having grades depend on final exams. It gives me more time to have an organized end of the year, especially with college applications nearing their deadlines. I know that the freshmen will be very thankful for not having to experience the fear that comes with your first finals, and that is definitely for the best. <laughs> our fine arts department is also kicking into high gear as we have our annual holiday season activities. Last weekend, the chamber choir sang at the Byron Colby Barn for the magical dessert. Both shows were sold out and the whole choir couldn't stop talking about how nice it felt to perform in one of those spaces again after not getting the privilege of doing so last year. <laughs> it was truly worth all of the effort put in for the last few months during our lunch periods. And afterwards, it was even more fun to restart the experience of caroling. This weekend, the chamber choir caroled at some very different venues, including the Green Oaks Nursing Home, Trader Joe's, and in front of the mall's Christmas tree. Although we were disappointed that we couldn't join in on the radio caroling with WGN, Mr. Little also ended up sending recordings of us singing, which the host played on Friday night. Now, the Hawthorne eighth graders will be joining the high school choirs and symphony orchestra this weekend, this Wednesday, at the annual holiday concert. We have a wide selection of tunes to sing with the eighth graders, and we're so excited to experience the snow falling during sleigh ride again. It is truly my favorite moment of any concert. Um, a few weeks ago, the Clothesline Project came to our school to talk to students during gym periods. The first day was really educational as each class had their own speaker who talked about healthy and unhealthy dating relationships, different types of abuse, how to recognize them, and how to ask for help. Mrs. Dillon sent out a survey to all those who attended, and 94% of those who surveyed said that this was important information to learn. 
Additionally, 90% of students reported that even though it was a difficult topic, they were pleased that it was presented. The second day was really impactful and emotional for many students. The main gym was filled with shirts hanging on clothesline, clotheslines, and each shirt had shared an individual's different story. It was really eye-opening for me to read all the different shirts and see how people have been affected and why it's important to recognize when you or someone you know may be in danger. This impacted some students personally, and some of those students chose to make their own shirts. The social workers and counselors were available for these students and anyone else who felt like they needed someone to talk to. Even though this is a sensitive and hard topic to talk about, many students took these two days very seriously and gained a lot of information from it. 95% of students surveyed said that they had significant empathy for victims after the experience. Thursday, December 9th marked having only 100 days left of high school for the seniors. Student council organized a senior breakfast with donuts to celebrate. It was a bittersweet moment having the whole senior class together before school realizing we only have a semester left together. And a quick update on our winter sports. This past weekend, the girls gymnastics team won the Candy Cane Invitational over 10 other schools and the team has been undefeated in their season so far. And the boys basketball team won the Thanksgiving tournament at Northridge with the 35-31 score over the home team, the Northridge Knights. And last Friday, VH Gift focused on perspective. Each class did an activity where they learned about the last, where they thought about the last item that each student bought and they added up all the costs. Then they put into perspective how many outfits they could buy for the students in our African sister school with the amount of money that they had spent. This was eye-opening for many students because it showed them how easily they could buy so many outfits with the amount of money they, that they spent on a daily basis. Our school's goal is to raise enough money to buy 200 outfits for the students of St. Jerome Primary School in Uganda. This, is, this project is one of several that we've done over the years. Since 2008, Vernon Hills has raised over $110,000 for building projects like a dormitory and a schoolhouse. Other projects have included a water filtration system, bunk beds for kids, portable lighting systems, and much more. And now on to Libertyville. There's a lot going on at Libertyville at this time of year. Winter sports are in the midst of their season and there's been many musical performances and school-wide initiatives. In sports news, the dance team performed at the Wildcat Welcome back in November, which was hosted at Libertyville and run by our cheer team. I performed, and it was our first opportunity to perform in person in almost two years because all competitions last year were virtual. It was really amazing to be back, and we felt a lot of support from other sports, team who, sports teams who took time from their own practices to watch us dance. The team placed first in that invite, as well as winning the Lake Zurich invite and Stevenson invite yesterday. Girls basketball won six of their last eight games to bring their record up to seven and four. The boys basketball team is also having success with a six and two record. Both teams are playing tonight, so good luck to them and go Cats. Within the winter sports season, we've also seen a rebirth of the student section, attending sporting events and cheering our athletes on. Students have been making an effort to try to broaden the range of athletic events that they attend to make sure that all, all sports feel equally supported, especially those that typically have less student spectators. Wrestling had a big meet against their rival Stevenson, which had a great student turnout with many students showing up to cheer the cats on. Talking to members of the wrestling team, they were really happy that students showed up and felt like it made a big difference in their performance. They ended up beating Stevenson 41 to 32, which is a great accomplishment. Other sports like bowling are planning to also have student sections at their meets. Finally, at the basketball game against Lake Forest earlier this month, students packed in, wearing orange to support the team. It was a really great show of school spirit and showed a lot of energy and enthusiasm. This is really due to Mr. Woods and student leaders who spread the word about athletic events through social media and school announcements. Typically, as it gets into the colder and more stressful months, there's a little bit less school spirit and connection within the school. After homecoming and all the spirit leading up to it, there are less events to unite the school, but the student section has contributed a lot to the community-like feeling among students. The Dare to Empower Lunch is an event that was held in November for female and female identifying students to learn how to use their voice and be confident in themselves. I attended this lunch with around 50 other girls in my lunch period, which was a really great turnout. We watched a couple of videos, talked in small groups about our experiences with classrooms, relationships, and friendships, and we got to hear Libertyville teachers talk about their own perspectives as well. I thought it was super beneficial to hear from so many others who had the same experiences as me, as well as hear older women talk about how they gain confidence in their own abilities. 
The group will be meeting again in the spring to further continue the discussion. <clears throat> Next week is finals week at Libertyville. However, with this year's final schedule, instead of the typical long periods with hour and a half finals in only a couple classes each day, we also have our regular class schedule. Finals for classes that are participating will take place on multiple days within the 45 minute periods, with many teachers I've heard doing a multiple choice exam one day and a free response the other. Most students I've talked to either have no final or one final, but a few have two or three. This is a huge difference from studying for and taking five or six finals as we would in the past. Compared to other years, there is considerably less stress around the school, uh, including myself, about grades. Rather than worrying about how a final exam could affect a borderline grade, students are focusing more on retaking tests and turning in homework to give their grade an extra boost into the A or B range. I am taking two finals, but rather than being worth 20%, they are only 10% of my grade, which is consistent with what I've heard from other students and teachers. Overall, the emphasis on reducing a final's impact on semester grades has made this time of year easier for students. Another big part of this time of year is the WISH project, which provides holiday gifts for families in need. Typically, each second period class would fundraise to buy gifts for one family, and the school would also host a dinner for the families to eat and receive their gifts. <laughs> this year, although we are not able to have every second period class participate as a school-wide activity and sell food in the hallways like usual, many classes and organizations have still found a way to contribute, raising money themselves. I was able to, to participate through the Interact Club, National Honor Society, and my statistics class, which is full of seniors who really wanted to continue the tradition, and many individual people really stepped up to sacrifice their time and money. WISH is a tradition that is really important to many people in the school, so it was great that we are still able to provide for local families in need. Student wrap. Coming to the close of our first semester, Libertyville buzz and excitement is very high. Over this past weekend, the Senior Student Council put on a dodgeball tournament to aid our ongoing food pantry collection. They raised over $500 and collected over 1,000 cans. This is a part of our serve season that is ongoing. Additionally, the entire school is participating in a clash of cans, which pits our sophomores and seniors against our freshmen and juniors in a competition to collect as many cans as possible. The halls of our schools are lined with reminders to bring in cans to support the cause. With COVID last year changing our schedule, the future of how our class schedules work is up in the air. A newly organized club at Libertyville, the gray area, discussed the pros and cons of proposed sorry, schedule changes. There wasn't a consensus as a hybrid block and eight periods all have their positives and negatives, but the one thing that every student agreed with is that their thoughts should weigh in into this decision. Moving into fine arts at Libertyville. Recently on December 2nd, LHS held the orchestra festival for students to display their skills and to add to the great end of the semester for a part of the music department. One acts were also going on and one act plays were performed on December 3rd, where students self-led skits that anyone at LHS was welcome to watch and enjoy. Lots of kids I am involved with in choir were participating in the one acts and have been talking about how much they enjoy the student-led aspect of the program and how anyone can do it even if they have not done theater before. There was also a Green Dot Action event on December 3rd where students signed up to be trained as a Green Dot. I myself have been trained as a Green Dot and it was one of the greatest experiences I have had at LHS. Green Dot not only focuses on anti-bullying, but also looks at dating violence and sexual harassment. With more and more students being Green Dot certified, we can make our school a safer and better place for everyone. December 10th was an evening of jazz held by the jazz band and they did all an amazing job. The choir, the choir concert will be held on December 14th and 15th, and we can't wait to show you all the music we have been working on, especially with this being our first holiday concert since 2019. With progress report num number four coming up and the semester coming to a close, students are rushing to perfect their final grades and study for any finals they may have with the new final schedule, as Ryan talked about. Overall, this first semester of this year was super successful, and I know many students are excited about winter break and being um, able to be off for two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Does any, uh, any board members have any questions for the students, especially as we think about the rest of our agenda, anything we'd like to ask for their input on? And I've given them permission to say that they don't know, and they'll get back to us if we have any questions <laughs> that they can't answer. Lisa Hessel, president. No? Okay, great job. Um, before I conclude the president's report, I do wanna mention that I've invited uh, Dr. K 
to do a presentation at next month's board meeting, um, I noticed that there is a new group called uh, the Libertyville High School Peak Performance and <laughs> Leadership Group, which is an initiative led by Dr. K, John Woods, Brenda Nelson, and Jen Ulix. It's an initiative to develop student leadership and mindfulness for peak performance. And it sounds really interesting. This group meets on Friday mornings before school. And we're going to hear a little bit more about this group and what they do during the president's report at our January board meeting. So thank you in advance for pulling that together. And that concludes the president's report. Wonderful. I get to dive into the superintendent's report and I will start by reading some additional good news um, that we have across the district. Um, uh, Vernon Hills High School family and consumer science teacher Leslie Nardini was named a Chicago Bears classroom legend powered by CDW. Bears chairman George McCaskey made the surprise presentation Friday afternoon via Zoom during Ms. Nardini's eighth period class. LHS and VHS students were selected for the IMEA All-State Ensembles. Students will re rehearse and perform with guest conductors from across the state January 26th through 29th in Peoria. Um, LHS students are Nick Anderson, Chloe Chan, Gavin Johnson, and Mark Tu. VHS students are Adam Bran, J excuse me, Jeffrey Brahms, Kaylee Kim, Noah Kim, John Lee, Neil Mehta, and Annika Urbanas. In the spirit of the season of giving, all Vernon Hills High School freshmen recently had the opportunity to volunteer as blanketeers for Project Linus during their freshman transition class. The goal of Project Linus is to provide love, a sense of security, warmth, and comfort to children who are seriously ill, traumatized, or otherwise in need through the gift of new, lovingly created handmade blankets. This year, the freshman class will donate 83 blankets. The Vernon Hills math team won first place at Thursday's North Suburban Math League competition hosted by Libertyville High School. Each grade level earned either a first or a second place finish. 14 Vernon Hills High School students received the Ellen Swick Cougar Class Act Award last Friday morning before school at an awards breakfast. Congratulations to the recipients, Elizabeth Munn, Melanie Sanchez, Nolan Clay, Cynthia Samaron Hernandez, Grace Kepke, Alexandria Sinclair, Adida Saboral, Kate Williams, Savannah Paterno, Ming Ni, Tina Henry, Kyle Hill, Talia Gluck, Emily Sontag, and Dylan Glazier. The following Libertyville High School students were named November True Wildcats, Peyton Adams, Erica Von Kirkbuck, Raina Turchi, Kira Rudstorf, Nate Mirlo, Caitlin Mitchell, Margot Kaufman, Caleb Christensen, Megan Hedlund, and Belinda Lee. And on Sunday, December 5th, Vernon Hills hosted the Special Olympics Area B Basketball Skills Competition. Luke Bardwell took home a bronze medal. Joel Smith took fourth place. And Hannah Kreischt came in fifth in their respective divisions. Haley Dunbar won the gold medal in her division and by doing so has qualified for the state basketball stills competition at the Illinois State University in March. And finally, um, on a personal note, yesterday um, I was able to um, uh, join in an activity with Vernon Hills High School um, with the principal and assistant principal and several teachers, Brian and I, and we did a, an inaugural community <laughs> outreach event um, where we visited the homes of approximately 35 students, either who had um, uh, language uh, barriers that may prevent them from having strong contacts or others, and it was just an amazing, amazing event. So I want to thank John and his team for launching that and know that that's something we'll carry out at other opportunities in the district. Lisa Hessel, president. Perfect. Great. Thanks, Dr. Herman. Okay, that brings us to our consent vote agenda. 
Um, she's sorry. got a lot more to do. Oh my goodness. Yes, sorry. I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking we're rolling, but we have, a, over. <laughs> uh, sorry, we have a lot more to hear from sorry. Dr. Herman. My apologies. They, they aren't long ones, but um, I added school safety update because I have received some questions and had some phone calls from parents following the school shooting in Michigan. And um, I was able to share with them information about all of the things that we have in place to keep our students and our staff safe. And uh, after talking with them, I thought it would be a good idea. Bryant oversees the safety at both schools for him to give a brief overview today, just so the public can re be reminded of all the things that we have in place to keep our students safe. So Brian, want to give us the brief sure. rundown. So um, I was trying to think of kind of breaking the school safety down. I kind of was looking at three categories. Number one would be, you know, communication and relationships. Number two would be, you know, personnel. Um, in our schools, and maybe the third would be infrastructure and procedure. So just kind of going through that, some of the things in communication relationships, you know, we have avenues um, for our students to be able to share information with our staff, whether that's through bowling reports, uh, the relationships that they build with our teachers um, and our staff, that if they see something, they also will say something. Um, I think the relationships that our staff, teachers, and um, support staff build with our students also is, is very important. Um, so the students have somebody that they always feel they can talk to if they're um, seeing something or if they're having issues. So that kind of builds into personnel that we do have personnel throughout the building, anywhere from our school resource officer, which is our SRO, uh, security and personnel and monitors, um, social workers, counselors, psychologists, they're also a piece of our personnel, I think, in preventing safety. So, you always, you know, you always kind of think of preventing safety is more police officers. And I think you want to start on the other end and you want to try to get out in front of that. And that's, again, building those relationships with our staff, with our students. We also have community partnerships with um, great community partnerships with the Village of Vernon Hills, Village of Libertyville, with our police, but also our fire and paramedics. Um, so countryside uh, down at this end of the district, and then also Village of Libertyville. So those communications uh, across the district, but also with the police department um, and some other um, community partnerships that we have, um, I think are key in, you know, any violence prevention that we can do. Um, then I look at like infrastructure and procedures. Um, procedures, you're looking at lockdown drills. Um, you're looking at, you know, <coughs> for our staff to be kind of recognized and, and aware of what's going on. So procedures there, but also then safety measures from our doors, our door system, the way it's set up um, to prevent, you know, people from entering the building, some of the bulletproof glass that we have at the entrances, the ballards at the entrances of our schools, um, and then cameras um, around all of our buildings. So, you know, looking at that, those are a lot of the measures without going into great detail. Um, I know, and it's been a few years, but we did present once. Um, I think a couple of years ago, we had our police and a fire from both, um, you know, um, Village of Libertyville and Vernon Hills come out and do a very extensive overview of our safety measures. But we, you know, as you look at anytime something happens, unfortunately, at another school, we also are getting reports and try to get some information to see maybe what happened there and what can we do, you know, in the future. So, you know, unfortunately there are events that you want to take though and learn from too. So that's a brief overview. Brian Kelly, associate superintendent. But the biggest key is, and I, I know Dr. Gilliam says this a lot, the Vernon Hill students probably see something, say something. And that's one of our, you know, biggest things, and you can, bullying uh, information can be, um, there are signs throughout the buildings, but they, somebody can just Google it or go on our website and they can input something anonymously. And that immediately gets sent to both schools. So even if it's somebody that's inputting something for Vernon Hills, uh, it goes into one system. So I, I get it. And then there's key people at both schools that get it and we follow up on it as fast as we can. So just to add one more example, the day following the school shooting, we did have increased patrol from both the village of Libertyville and Vernon Hills to make sure that our student parking lots were safe and 
So it, it's not only the things we always have in place that Brian described, but our relationships then can kick into gear during a heightened sensitivity times. I've always felt like this district was very proactive um, with school safety. My daughter graduated in 2018, my youngest, and her, I was very involved in parent cats back then. And Libertyville's police department came and did a excellent presentation for parent cats of the proactive things. And there wasn't a precipitating incident that year or anything. They, this district has been working on this for a long time. So I think it's important for the public to take some comfort in the fact that this district is proactive when it comes to the safety of our schools, obviously, um, and that this has been an ongoing process for years. So thank you for the update, Brian. We appreciate and, it. And we're really lucky. Great police departments at both villages and, and our chief of police at, at both places are great. They have been over the years, but working with those, uh, you know, and having uh, school resource officers in the building. The other thing is there are, uh, our school resource officers have changed over the years and sometimes but some of those um, school resource officers are um, have become security, head of security at both buildings. And then there are also police officers out in the building. So we have a lot of people that have connections to the schools and they you know, want the schools to be safe. So that's good. both of our police departments take it upon themselves to remain updated around the country in terms of attending seminars and understanding what other schools are doing. Um, to, you know, ensure safety of students in case there's anything that, you know, we could implement. So it's not just our district, it's our communities as a whole that are committed to that. I'll also add a, a piece that's often overlooked and that's the uh, <laughs> cybersecurity and the, the, the technology monitoring tools and things that are in place. I know they're in place here and in place at many schools to monitor and keep our, our students safe from many of those same issues. Um, but through their the technology that they use to communicate. So that's also an important thing. Lisa Hassel, president. I think you bring up a good point. Um, do you want to touch on a little bit of why we don't publish every detail of our security mm -hmm. measures? I think that's an important piece to touch on because if there are things that seem vague, there might be a good reason why. Correct. Yeah, there are some things obviously we have in place at both schools or some things that, you know, we don't want to publicly share with people because, you know, for the safety of all of our students um, um, that we don't want them to know, I think, the inner workings of some of the things that we have going on. But assure you, there are a lot of things in place um, that we have to keep our students safe throughout the day. And I know uh, very uh, recently in a couple of the years past, we've de been designated one of the safest school districts mm -hmm. in the country. And while that doesn't guarantee that we can prevent anything from ever happening, I think the things that we can control, there is evidence that, that we do. Um, so thank you for mm -hmm. bringing that very important update to us. Absolutely. I also wanted to share with the board uh, an update on strategic planning. We have surveys that are going out. So if you're a parent in the district, you received something um, from us uh, because the strategic plan survey is for parents. Students will be taking the survey tomorrow um, in their social studies classes. And then um, all staff also receive the opportunity to uh, uh, participate in that. So we'll be gathering that data now and analyzing it over uh, winter break and into early January, and it will be available and part of the work we do at our January 21st um, next strategic planning day. So I look forward to that. And Brian, back to Bryant with her COVID-19 update. So our um similar to the COVID update that I gave in our committee meeting, but I do want to share the COVID update. So there are two things that we kind of monitor and we publish on our website. So we monitor uh, the number of COVID cases and quarantine ca cases um, in both of our schools. So I update that, I try to update that in the evening or early the next morning from the previous day. Um, and if anyone has been monitoring that week by week, there has been a little uptick in uh, the number of cases at both schools. Um, and that could be due to a number of things. Uh, it could be from Thanksgiving. It could be the cold weather. 
Um, but the one thing, if you look on our dashboard of cases, is that our quarantine cases have kind of held pretty small, pretty steady. And the reason for that is that um, we have a high number of vaccinated students and staff. Um, and so they don't always need to be quarantined. And then those students that are exposed in a classroom study that are unvaccinated can um, use test to stay, which we are utilizing and our nurses are doing test to stay. So they're testing unvaccinated students every two days so that they're able to stay in the classroom. So, um, so if you're looking at that dashboard, you could see our number of cases. And again, there has been um, a little rise at both schools, but our quarantine cases, um, you know, they due to school exposure has remained low. Um, and the other part of the dashboard that I update is the positivity rate and then the number of cases in um, our two zip codes and then kind of compare it to Lake County. And there has been, again, an uptick in the positivity rate um, and the number of cases. Um, I'll update it again on the 15th. And I just kind of looked at it again and it has kind of come back down a little bit. So there was a rise, I think, from Thanksgiving um, kind of coming back down again. Two things from our nurses that they really want to emphasize, and we may send out some more information, is uh, number one, obviously, get the booster shot. And for those that are now eligible 16 and 17-year-olds, they say get the booster shot um, is very helpful. Um, and again, consult with your doctor, physician. Um, but I think a lot of people are recommending getting the booster shot. Number two is... If you're not feeling well or having symptoms or anything, please stay home. Please call the nurses. They will take the time. They would rather have more people call that are staying home and answer those questions than have to deal with it, you know, somebody coming into school and exposing others. So, um, and I know it's the end of the semester and everyone wants to finish up everything. But again, if you're not feeling well, stay home, call the nurses, um, and then, you know, get tested before you come back to school. So. And then testing update, um, we still are testing twice a week. We have two options for people to test that are unvaccinated, um, that are participating in extracurricular activities. Um, and next week, we have one more testing date before the holidays. No testing with shield testing because they shut down over the holidays. But upon return, those staff that are unvaccinated and students that are in extracurricular activities will all test on that Monday, January 10th when we return for school. Brian Kelly, Associate Superintendent. Any Thank questions? You. Brian Kelly, Associate Superintendent. No questions? All right, then we will finish the superintendent's report with five FOIA requests. I'll give a brief summary. Uh, the first is a requester, Sean Gay, and it was an amended request um, from November 12th, and we responded on November 19th. And the information um, was um, asking for the complete information, even though it was voluminous and the willingness to pay $200. Um, so Bryant did give all of that information and it took um, 18 hours um, to, to complete that request. Requester Lawrence Falby um, requested information, uh, all documents, emails, correspondence, um, cor corresponding to um, concerning the inclusion survey that was the subject of Superintendent Herman's email dated Friday, November 12th. Um, and that was sent on November 17th. Our third request is from Rich Cortez and the information requested, it's a very long request and it is for salary schedule data, um, information on <laughs> any different salaries for psychologists, social worker trainers, and many different lists of specific categories. Um, and then um, other things about HSAs, maximum learning. It's, it looks like it's a request that has to do with comparable data for schools. The fourth one is from Seamus Quinn and um, requesting information on the demolition of structures and bid processes. And the final one is an anonymous request and it was asking for a breakdown of the budgets as it pertains to individual departments at each of the high schools, as well as enrollment in each course. And all of those were satisfied in a timely manner. And now the superintendent report is complete. Um, 
Thank you, Dr. Herman, and to Bryant for continuing to be so diligent um, updating us um, with the COVID metrics. Now, we will move on to our consent vote agenda. These are items that were discussed in committee. I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent vote agenda as presented. So moved. Second. Great. Any discussion? Okay, roll call, please. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Great. Motion passes. <coughs> and I will turn it over to Jim Batson for the PMP committee. Okay. Thank you. Um, First up on the program and personnel committee are a series of board policies. This is the first reading. There will be no action taken here, but it's acknowledgement of the first reading. We actually reviewed uh, an overview of these policies in committee uh, earlier. Uh, just as a forewarning, this is only the first group of policies. There's a second batch that will be coming uh, next month. But uh, these will return to the agenda next month for a final adoption, a second reading and final adoption. Mm -hmm. But these uh, are from the, um, uh, the the policy manual of this uh, section two, three, and four and five, I should say. So there's a there's a whole string of them. So I I don't believe we need to read even the titles or anything, but just uh, for the record that uh, these were uh, read into the first. <laughs> reading this evening. Um, next on the agenda, a Butler Lake Pier agreement with the Village of Libertyville. And I will turn this over to Brian. Sure. So the, the Libertyville High School is um, looking to utilize its one of its resources right out the back door, Butler Lake, um, for um, their science classes, for uh, some of their outdoor education, for uh, bass fishing club and um, some of those activities. Unfortunately, there is not a pier on the south end of the lake. There's only one on the north end that the village owns. So our school has been looking into installing a uh, floating pier on the south side of the lake. And um, they had to work with the uh, village to get a application for an engineering permit. Part of that process was also working with the Army Corps of Engineers to get permission which um, they did. They fill out all the applications to put a up to a 40 foot um, floating pier and have received approval from um, the village and also the Army Corps. But part of the last process was to have the intergovernmental agreement um, with us and the village of Libertyville for this. So we are looking for approval for this and then the school will go back and look at what type of pier and the cost. They've done some initial stuff, but they didn't really dive too much into it because we ran in to see if we could actually, you know, do this. Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now. Okay. So this motion will be for the approval of a um, agreement, an intergovernmental yep. agreement with the village of Libertyville. So not the And Kelly Amade at yeah. the village has been working, you know, with, with it, with this agreement, we've been going back and forth. So, so can we have a uh, motion, please? Move to approve the Butler Lake Pier agreement with the village of Libertyville. Second. Okay. Any further questions or comments? And just a, as a note, we've discussed this uh, quite a bit in committee uh, earlier in the evening. So I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Is it a bass fishing club or is that an IHSA team? That's IHSA team. As a former athletic director, I should know that. But I, I just want to point that out because <laughs> sorry, we're, we're supporting one of our IHSA competitive yes, teams. Yes, we are. Here. Okay. <laughs> not to call you out on that. Not, I just not, didn't know. not to call out the former athletic director. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and as you stated, I just wanted to be sure we make explicit that we are not approving any costs or acquisition or materials. We're just approving the intergovernmental agreement. agreement. So we can move forward with the project. Yeah. Great. But we do look forward to hearing details about the project in the future. Mm -hmm. So any other questions, comments? Okay. Roll call, please, Carol. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Essel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Motion passes. And then last on the uh, PMP agenda is a 
district leadership team proposal uh, that was presented earlier in committee. I will turn this over to Dr. Herman. Yes, thank you. Um, as a result of two retirements, we um, examined the leadership structure and made recommendations um, to make some adjustments in both uh, duties and job titles um, and um, are seeking the board's authorization to move forward with the plan as presented this evening. Okay. Can we have a uh, motion, first of all? I move to approve the district leadership team proposal. Second. Okay, any further questions or comments from the board? Uh, we noted in committee that this was an outstanding job of updating our um, staffing needs to align with our strategic plan and daring mission. Um, and there was um, a lot of really thoughtful and um, creative and um, just great work that went into um, allocating how we spend district dollars on salaries where it really is going to have the most impact for students. So thank you. Okay. Anything else? I'd just like to add that when we were discussing it, the word focus came up in everyone's <clears> feedback. <throat> so it allows these individuals to really focus versus picking things up as a hobby and not being able to actually devote <clears throat> the time that it needs. So want to find that out as well as the accountability that it needs mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah yeah good point okay anything else okay roll call please carol carmichael hi drum key hi hessel hi <clears throat> kokarni hi rooney hi batson hi benjamin hi okay motion passes i will turn it back over to Chair Lisa. Thank you. And I will turn it over to uh, Casey Rooney for the facilities and finance committee portion of our meeting. All right. We have two items in need of some attention tonight. Uh, the first one is resolution to designate preparation of tentative budget for fiscal year 2023. This is the beginning of our budgeting process. Want to add any more details, Dan? No, <laughs> it's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> Basically, we need to uh, pass a resolution so that Dan can begin the budget process. We have to tell him what to do. That's right. No, uh, <laughs> I think he knows what to do. Uh, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. 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 Thank you. Roll call, Carol, please. Rumkey. Aye. Hessel. <clears throat> Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. All right, motion passes. Moving on to the next one, a resolution to adopt the teacher's retirement system of the state of Illinois supplemental savings plan. We discussed this earlier in committee. Any details you wanna add, Dan? This is a 457 plan that TRS is requiring us to adopt a resolution in said form. Okay, so we are, so we are doing so. Can I get a motion to adopt the resolution uh, for the teacher's retirement system of the state of Illinois, the supplemental savings plan? So moved. Second. All right, motion passes. Roll call, please. Essel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. All right, that motion passes. And that's it for facilities and finance tonight. Well, you get the speed record. Surprising, yes. I know. Ah. Moving on to uh, school boards, I'll pass it back to President Hessel. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jim uh, for any update for IASB. Actually, I'll, I'll just give a brief update and, and thank everybody for attending the, uh, the joint conference the week before Thanksgiving. I think it was a terrific <laughs> experience to actually be in that environment uh, in person, see speakers and be able to communicate with colleagues and see um, various uh, piece of information. I will give one brief update um, uh, related to the resolutions committee, and and that is most everything went as expected in terms of what was recommended. Uh, the one I believe it was resolution number fifteen, the one about the gun safety in the homes. Um, 
because of the way the the procedure goes um, when a uh, a resolution like that is brought up for discussion, the discussion continues until somebody calls for a, a calls for the question is what they call it. It's a parliamentary procedure that ends the discussion, and then you vote on calling the question, and if that passes, then you can vote on the resolution. And once again, this year, like in past years, uh, it was uh, called for discussion. Some discussion occurred, it, the question was called, that failed. So we never got to vote on that particular resolution that everyone was so interested in. Um, I think had that process happened just a few weeks later, I think there would have been I believe a different outcome in terms of the um, the urgency, the sense of urgency generated by the, the the sad situation in Michigan. But uh, just to, as a as a means of uh, communicating back exactly what happened, I know there were a lot of people interested in that, but unfortunately, the we didn't really even get a chance to vote on that. So, and can you? Um let us know when the full resolution vote is published. Um, it is published. It's on the it's on the ISB, our IASB website. Is it, it just recently? It was published relatively. I know I've seen it. I saw okay. it like a week later. So it's it's out there along with all the you know the the um, um, how the votes went and and what was approved, what wasn't approved, and pretty much what was recommended by the the resolutions committee was also was was pretty much approved with that <laughs> and I believe one other exception that just didn't get get a vote so okay great yeah thank you mm -hmm. um and we have a brief update for CEDAW yes uh the governing board well so we had our our most recent governing board meeting um man I think it was last Last Wednesday, it's all a blur. I'm not sure. It was last week. <laughs> I promise I was there. Um, so we've received um, an update on the CEDAW strategic plan. Um, and that came from um, CEDAW superintendent, uh, Ms. Valerie Donnan. And then we also um, had a vote regarding uh, the approval of an MOU uh, with CEDAW's teachers union and a separate one with the CEDAW support staff association with regard to COVID leave. So that is a challenge that's ongoing within CEDAW is how to handle um, absences amongst, you know, faculty and staff. Um, <coughs> so we, we passed a memorandum of understanding with, uh, you know, those, those uh, limitations and whatnot understood. So that's basically it, but Everything is is chugging along at CEDAW and the same issues that uh, you know come up in our regular school district board meetings come up within the CEDAW uh, space as well. And I think I had mentioned this before, but um, COVID, uh -huh. their management of COVID is even a bit more challenging because they have um, they deal with a, a population of students that has uh, medical fragilities and just complex, uh, issues where, um, masks can't always be worn quite literally. Um, there's other equipment that needs to be on the face or near, near the child, uh, in order for them to communicate or what have you. Um, so keeping those kids safe as well as keeping the faculty safe, um, is top of mind, but it presents more challenges certainly with such a special population of kids all that's happening there. Great. Thank you for keeping mm -hmm. us updated and for your work yeah, um, as pleasure. our liaison. Um, any future agenda items that we'd like to discuss? Uh, I'm going to say it again, though. So on our, I just called up the post for our last, <laughs> and the last item on here says update on Committee for Environmental Sustainability. So I, I'd like to push that forward. Yeah. And let's, let's see that next month. So I think that's something we jointly should probably own for accountability on that on the post for next month. Yep. Okay. Super. Great. Thank you for the reminder. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, any other future agenda items? 
Okay, if not, I'm looking for a motion to retire to executive session. So moved. Second. Great. Um, roll call, please. Kulkarni? Aye. Rooney? Aye. Batson? Aye. Benjamin? Aye. Carmichael? Aye. Drumkey? Aye. Hessel? Aye. Um, so we will discuss employment of employees, collective negotiating matters, and lease of real properties. Uh, when we return to open session, no further action will be taken and we will adjourn. So we thank everybody and we will meet in executive session. We'll do a five minute break. So we will start at, uh, let's call it 8 12. Thank you. Turn to open session. So moved. <laughs> Second. Great. Roll call, please. Batson. Aye. Batson. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Vessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Thank you. Move to adjourn. All in favor? No, Aye. sorry. No, we have Got to a roll call. call for adjournment. I'm sorry. And you're going to be last. <laughs> Batson. Aye. Batson. Yeah. Bye. Carmichael. Aye. Drum key. Aye. Hustle. Aye. Aye. Okay, we got a lot to sign tonight. We are adjourned. Oh. Mm -hmm.